In the early days of jet aviation, when the sky was still a frontier and speed was the ultimate prize, there were men who pushed machines beyond what anyone thought possible. These weren't just pilots, they were pioneers, riding metal birds into the unknown, chasing numbers that seemed more like science fiction than engineering reality. And among them, one aircraft stands out, not for its longevity, not for its combat record, but for its sheer ambition and the tragic cost of reaching too far, too fast. This is the story of the Bell X-2, a rocket-powered arrow that dared to break the sound barrier twice, once in controlled flight, once in a failed dive that ended with a pilot's last words echoing over the desert. I'm going up. I'm going up. It began in the late 1940s, right after Chuck Yeager had shattered the myth that the sound barrier was unbreakable. The world was stunned. If you could go Mach 1, why not Mach 2? Why not Mach 3? The U.S. Air Force and the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, the NACA, which would later become NASA, were hungry for data. They needed to understand what happened to an aircraft at extreme speeds, where heat built up faster than metal could handle it, where control surfaces became useless, and where the air itself seemed to fight back. The answer came from Bell Aircraft Corporation, the same company that had built the X-1, the plane Jaeger flew. But this time, they weren't just building a supersonic test bed, they were building a hypersonic one. The X-2 was designed to reach Mach 3, to fly higher than 100,000 feet, and to gather data no other aircraft could. It was a flying laboratory, wrapped in stainless steel and titanium, powered by a liquid-fueled rocket engine that burned alcohol and liquid oxygen. Its wings were swept back sharply, its nose pointed like a dagger, and its cockpit was tiny, barely big enough for one man to sit upright. The first X-2 rolled out in 1952. It looked like something out of a pulp sci-fi magazine, sleek, menacing, and utterly alien compared to the propeller-driven fighters of the era. But it wasn't ready to fly yet. The rocket engine, developed by Curtis Wright, was temperamental. The fuel system was complex, and the materials, well, they were pushing the limits of what was available. Stainless steel was chosen for its ability to withstand high temperatures, but even that had its limits. Titanium was used in critical areas, but it was expensive and hard to work with. This wasn't just a test plane. It was a gamble. The first flight didn't come until June 1952, and it was a glide test. No power, just drop from a B-50 bomber and see if it handled okay. It did, barely. The pilot, Gene Skip Ziegler, reported that the controls were sluggish, the ride bumpy, and the landing rough. But it flew. That was enough to keep the program alive. Then came the powered flights. In November 1955, after years of delays, testing, and redesigns, the X-2 finally lit its rocket engine for the first time in free flight. Pilot Frank K. Pete Everest Jr. took it to Mach 2.06, the fastest any human had ever flown. He landed safely, exhilarated, and declared it the smoothest ride I've ever had. The press went wild. The Air Force celebrated. The dream of Mach 3 seemed within reach. But the X-2 wasn't done. Not yet. There were still questions unanswered. What happened to the aircraft at higher altitudes? How did the heat affect the structure? Could a pilot actually control the plane at those speeds? And most importantly, could anyone survive if things went wrong? That's where the real danger lay. Because while the X-2 was built to push boundaries, it wasn't built to forgive mistakes. The controls were sensitive, the stability unpredictable, and the margin for air razor thin. At Mach 2, the air around the aircraft heated up so much that the skin temperature reached over 600 degrees Fahrenheit. At Mach 3, it would be closer to 1200 degrees, hot enough to soften aluminum, warp steel, and melt the edges of control surfaces. 
And then there was inertia coupling, a phenomenon that had not been fully understood at the time. When an aircraft flies at high speed and high altitude, small movements can trigger violent, uncontrollable oscillations. The plane doesn't just roll or yaw, it tumbles, flips, spins, and often breaks apart before the pilot can react. It's not a crash, it's a disintegration. The X-2 was vulnerable to this. Its design, optimized for speed, made it unstable at the very moments when control mattered most. Pilots knew this. They accepted it. Because for some, the risk was worth the reward. For others, it was just part of the job. By 1956, the program was nearing its peak. The Air Force had two X-2s. One had already crashed during a ground test, killing a mechanic. The second was still flying, but it was showing signs of wear and tear. The engines were unreliable. The fuel lines leaked. The instruments sometimes failed mid-flight. Still, they kept going because the data was too valuable to stop now. On September 7, 1956, Captain Milben Gurr Mel Apt climbed into the cockpit of the X-2. He was a seasoned test pilot, known for his calm demeanor and precise flying. He had trained for this moment for months. He knew the risks. He had studied the data from previous flights. He had practiced emergency procedures until they were second nature. He was ready. The plan was simple. Climb to 65,000 feet, ignite the rocket, and accelerate to Mach 3. Then shut down the engine, glide back down, and land. Easy, right? Except nothing about the X-2 was easy. On 8 a.m., the B-50 mothership released the X-2 over Edwards Air Force Base. Apt fired the rocket, the thrust slammed him back into his seat. The needle on the Mach meter climbed. Mach 1, Mach 1.5, Mach 2, then Mach 2.5. The ground below blurred into streaks of brown and blue. The sky turned black. He was above the clouds, above the weather, above everything. He was alone, hurtling through space at three times the speed of sound. He hit Mach 3.196 higher than anyone had ever gone. He held it for 20 seconds, 20 seconds of pure, unfiltered speed. Then he shut off the engine. The roar faded. The silence rushed in. He began his descent. That's when things started to go wrong. As he descended through 65,000 feet, the aircraft began to oscillate. Small movements became larger. The stick felt heavy. The controls responded sluggishly. He tried to correct, but the plane was fighting him. Inertia coupling kicked in. The X-2 began to tumble, spinning wildly, flipping end over end. Apt fought it, pulling back on the stick, trying to regain control. But it was too late. Over the radio, his voice was calm, almost detached. I'm going up. I'm going up. Then, static. Silence. The X-2 broke apart at 65,000 feet. Apt ejected, but his parachute didn't open in time. He fell 40,000 feet and hit the desert floor at terminal velocity. His body was found near the wreckage, still strapped to his ejection seat. The X-2 was gone. So was Mel Apt.